Um, I'm going to start with these words, um, not my own words, but a quotation. <clears throat> Israel's attacks against civilian infrastructure, especially electricity, are war crimes. Cutting off men, women and children from water, electricity and heating, with winter coming, these are acts of pure terror, and we have to call it as such. Um, now, they're the words of the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, um, except I've actually changed one word there. Um, that was, in fact, a remark she made in relation to Ukraine almost exactly a year ago. Uh, and you'll notice the word I changed when I read out the original quote. Russia's attacks against civilian infrastructure, especially electricity, are war crimes. Cutting off men, women and children from water, electricity and heating with winter coming, these are acts of pure terror. Uh, Fair comment. But if that is true in relation to Russia a year ago or now, why is it not true also in relation to Israel? And I think at the moment that has to be our starting point, acknowledging and recognising the collective punishment on a massive scale by Israel of the Palestinians and to recognise that what they are unleashing now, what was announced openly and explicitly in racist uh, and appalling terms, by Israeli politicians on Monday, talking about a total blockade, blocking entry of food, water, electricity, fuel, medicine, and referring to the people in Gaza as animals. That is terror on an almighty scale. And it is going to get worse over the days and the weeks ahead. They can do that because there is an absolutely massive imbalance militarily between the Israeli state and Hamas, a guerrilla organization. Hundreds of Israelis have tragically been killed since Hamas offensive began on Saturday. And what we are now seeing from Israel is the undertaking of the killing of thousands uh, of Palestinians. Now, to make sense of this, we need to do something that the politicians in the media are absolutely refusing to do. We need to talk about the context. We need to talk about a number of contexts that form the background to what is going on now, and I want to outline three uh, of those contexts this evening. The first is to do with Gaza itself. Now, Gaza is a densely populated strip of land where over two million Palestinians live. It's been occupied and continues to be occupied by Israel since 1967. It's been under siege by land, sea and air by Israel since 2005, a crippling siege that has absolutely devastated the Gazan economy, so that it's dependent upon humanitarian aid. There was massive unemployment and acute poverty and denying Palestinians living there the most basic freedoms. That has been compounded by periodic military assaults by Israel. 2006, 2009, uh, 2012, 2014, 2021. The worst of those in 2014 saw over 2,000 Palestinians killed, hundreds of them uh, children. Now, Hamas <clears throat> rose to power, if it can be, be called that, uh, running uh, the Gaza Strip through elections in 2006, and it's governed there since. But within the occupation, within the framework, of course, of occupation, blockade and those repeated military assaults. It succeeded originally in 2006, uh, precisely because of the deep frustrations with the Oslo process in the 1990s and the aftermath of that, the fallout of that which led to an incredibly weak Palestinian authority dominated by Fatah in the uh, West Bank, which has been and continues to be sadly complicit in the Israeli occupation. And that's where that came from, the bitterness and the frustration uh, towards that. I want to look a little bit more widely now, the Palestinian situation uh, more broadly. So the second context to think about is what's been happening to the Palestinians in Israeli politics. So towards the end of last year, Israelis elected the most racist and the most right-wing government in its entire history, one in which far-right politicians are at the heart of government. Violence by Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank has reached record levels, and that is deeply connected to the brutal violence of the Israeli state itself, with rising numbers of Palestinians killed by the Israeli state. 2022 was the worst year for Israeli killings of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank for over two decades. 2023 has proved to be much worse. 
Uh, a particular episode I want to refer to because it illustrates so much of what's going on uh, is something that happened in February, a pogrom against the Palestinian town of Huara, which is near Nablus in the West Bank. Violent mobs of settlers, about an estimated 400 settlers, burned down Palestinian homes, burnt down burnt uh, Palestinian cars. They injured hundreds of Palestinians and killed uh, one person. Homes, shops, cars, agricultural land, all set ablaze by settlers while the Israeli forces looked on. Many of the houses that were set alight had families inside at the time. Settlers put tyres in front of the doors of Palestinians blazing homes to make escape harder. Now, <clears throat> this isn't just about the settlers. There is a thread, an intimate thread, connecting this kind of mob violence to the very top of Israeli politics and to the top of the Israeli state. At the time, Israel's finance minister became notorious when he said that Hawara should be wiped out. The chair of Israel's National Security Committee said a closed, burned Hawara, that's what I want to see. This is the kind of genocidal mindset that mainstream Israeli politicians uh, have. At that time, Israeli forces had already carried out a deadly assault on Nablus uh, in February, killing 11 Palestinians, wounding over 100. There was a raid in Jenin in January, which resulted in 10 Palestinian deaths, and we've seen more of this in the months since. So these fanatical settler groups are closely connected to the government. Their representatives uh, are represented in mainstream politics, and their violence is either encouraged or condoned by Israeli uh, forces. We've also seen the repeated incursions to the third holiest site in the Muslim world, Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. We've seen an increase in house demolitions. We've seen yet more settled build, settlement building and so on uh, and so on. So to go to the third and, and final context I want to flag up, which is to do with the international, so-called international community. Now, there's a number of elements to this. In the Arab world, we've had for some years a process of what's called normalization. Closer diplomatic and business relations between Arab states uh, and the apartheid state of Israel. And that has happened despite massive popular support for the Palestinians continuing on the Arab street. And in particular, at the moment, there are talks ongoing between Israel and Saudi Arabia. If you look at the West, in the US, which has uh, bankrolled Israel for decades, uh, Democrat, uh, Democratic politicians find it increasingly difficult to square their support for Israel with any sort of liberal or progressive values, and yet that doesn't stop them supporting yet more military aid, yet more arms deals uh, between the US and Israel. And there's a lot of polling evidence that indicates a uh, historic shift, I would say, away from support for Israel amongst a lot of American people, in particular Democrat voters, and within the Jewish American community, there is much more um, criticism of Israel than we are used to. But that is not finding political expression in Washington. In this country, as I think we all know, we've got an incredibly loyally pro-Israel government, uh, and criticism of Israeli apartheid has become almost taboo in the Labour Party, even on the parliamentary left of the Labour Party. We've seen Starmer's outrageous comments this week, insisting on an absolute defence of Israel, but that is not a new development simply since what happened uh, at the weekend. That is part of a trajectory, and that space opened up by Corbyn's leadership within the Labour Party has been emphatically uh, shut down. We've got a government that is now trying to push through legislation, stopping public bodies from divesting from Israel, and we've even got a Home Secretary now who's talking about criminalising the waving of Palestine flags or chanting things like, from the river to the sea, uh, Palestine will be free. So that's the background. That's where we're at. And just um, a, a couple of concluding comments, particularly relating to, to, to the title of, of, of this meeting, thinking ahead and thinking about uh, the way forward. Um, we need to keep in mind, whenever we think about solutions and alternatives, that Israel encompasses today the whole of historic Palestine. It dominates as a kind of single state reality across historic Palestine, a kind of greater Israel. So across the West Bank, Gaza, annexed Jerusalem, inside Israel itself, the Palestinian minority there, and impacting on the Palestinian refugees. Israel dominates one way or another absolutely everything. And we've seen, I think, an historic move away from the whole conflict between two sides narrative that dominated from the 90s 
uh, with the Oslo process. But in response to that, we need to clearly articulate that the only just solution, and I think the only remotely practical solution, is a one-state, secular, democratic state uh, solution across the whole of Palestine. It can seem remote, but it is the only solution that addresses the needs of all Palestinians, while also safeguarding Jews living in the region. And the two-state alternative has been absolutely destroyed by Israel. So in a sense, one state is inevitable. But the question now is, is it an apartheid state, a greater Israel, which has different forms in different places, but is racist, is violent, is deeply unjust, deeply unequal and denies people their rights? Or are we talking about a single democratic state in which everyone's rights are respected? I'll leave Shabir to say a little bit more, and in particular to pick up the threads around how we achieve that, how we move forward. But just very quickly, part of the answer has to be the resistance of the Palestinians themselves. Not a sort of doomed military strategy associated with Hamas, but in a broader sense, Palestinians' own resistance has to be central to any strategy. But that isn't enough on its own. We also need to think about the global movement, the anti-normalisation movements and protests in the Arab world, the BDS movement and the solidarity protests elsewhere. And in this country, it's absolutely critical that we oppose our own government's complicity in Israel's horrors, but also we need to build a wider anti-war movement and a wider anti-imperialism, which has Palestine at the heart, but goes beyond, beyond that and looks, and looks beyond that. The next step is Saturday, massive national demonstration on the streets of London. We have to assert that we keep the space open for Palestine solidarity. We won't let them demonise our...